Through the long centuries, the search for God, as it has been called, has been the program of the Christian churches. The books have gone on piling up ever since St. John wrote his gospel, and still there is no end in sight, writes the celebrated Rufus M. Jones of works on the life of Jesus. Hardly fewer are the books that undertake to tell us about the reality and nature of God, he says. They are almost as numerous as the leaves that strow the brooks in Vallambrosa. There is certainly no slacking of interest in this supreme quest, end of quote. In every sect and every age, the theologians describe themselves as engaged in this mighty quest, and repeatedly and increasingly the Latter-day Saints are held to be opinionated and narrow because they do not join in the search. Why should they? Consider the position of the early Christians on this subject. First, perhaps we should explain our practice in these talks of referring everything back to those early Christians as described in the Bible, the nine, as the number stands today, apostolic fathers, and the five early apologists. We make no attempt to present an, uh, at present, that is, to argue out the position of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Here we are simply indicating briefly, as we must, that for better or for worse, the Mormons consistently find themselves in the company of the ancient saints, and accordingly far removed from the ways of conventional Christians. That doesn't necessarily prove that they are right on every or any issue, but it more than implies that if the ancient Christians were on the right track, so are they. It is a historical, not a theological or a philosophical vindication of our prophets that concerns us here. It's merely one approach to the problem of divine authenticity of the restored church, but it is an important one. Well, take, for instance, this matter of the search for God. What did the early church think about it? For an answer, we very properly go back to Justin, the first and greatest of the early apologists. In the famous dialogue with Trypho, one of the most valuable and often quoted of all Christian writings, Justin tells us, about his first conversation with a Christian. At the time, as he describes it, Justin himself was a professional philosopher who'd never heard of the gospel. The Christian, a venerable old man whom he met while out walking, asked Justin, do not the philosophers spend all their time talking about God? And don't all their investigations deal with the subject of his single rule and providence? Or is it not the proper business of philosophy to engage in the systematic search for God? To all this, Justin, a philosopher and a pagan, be it remembered, unhesitatingly answers, yes, that's the business of philosophy. So you see, the search for God is not a peculiarly Christian thing. In fact, it's not Christian at all. Was Peter's confession the reflection of a man feeling his way forward, bit by bit, out of the dark? Was Paul's testimony the guarded utterance of a man speculating on the possible existence and nature of God? When Stephen was stoned, was his consolation that there might be a something somewhere? Did the Lord ask Peter, James, and John, or rather did he take them up onto the mountain of the transfiguration with him to speculate on the probable existence of an indefinable essence that might be called God? Did the resurrected Lord instruct the apostles for 40 days in syllogistic exercises to prove his existence? The thought that the apostles might be searching for God is simply laughable. Yet that was one of the first danger signals to appear in the church, the predicted activity of those intellectuals who would be ever seeking and never coming to a knowledge of the truth. Already at the end of the first century, Ignatius of Antioch writes to the Trillians, There are some Christ betrayers bearing about the name of Christ in deceit and corrupting the word of gospel. They do not believe in his resurrection. They introduce God as a being unknown. And to the Smyrnaeans, he says, Do ye therefore mark those who preach other doctrines, how they affirm that the Father of Christ cannot be known. The great crime of the heretics in general, according to the apostolic constitutions, is, quote, that they blaspheme God by saying he is unknowable and not the Father of Christ, but is indescribable, unutterable, unnameable, and self-begotten. We, the sons of God, it's supposed to be the apostles talking here, declare that there is one God alone, the Lord of the law and the prophets, the creator of all things, the Father of Christ, not self-caused, not self-begotten, as the Gnostics say, but everlasting and without beginning, dwelling in inaccessible light. He is not two or three or many, but eternally one, not unknown or unnamed at all, but proclaimed through the law and the prophets. Irenaeus' first charge against the Gnostics is, they say the Father cannot be known. On the other hand, nothing shocked or scandalized the pagans more 
than the Christian insistence on knowing God. Celsus is outraged at such, such presumption, and to his charge, Oregon replies that God is indeed unknown, he says, to bad men. The fountain of all error, according to Miletus of Sardis, is that man does not know God and accordingly adores in his place something that is not God. Hillary reports with dismay that with the exception of Bishop Eleusius and a few others, the greater part of the ten Asian provinces where I now stay are ignorant of the true God. And those ten Asian provinces were the most popular communities in the Christian world and the earliest converted. Whether Hillary's own knowledge of God was true or not is not the question. The point is that he feels it extremely important that Christians should know God. The first principle of the law which God has given to men, says Lactantius, is to know God himself. And not to know him is the greatest of all faults. We have already quoted Hillary and Athanasius in these talks as expressing the feeling that lay like a shadow over the fourth century that there's something seriously wrong when Christians take to looking for God. And we have noted Tertullian's remark that it's all right for philosophers to grope around for answers to the great questions of the universe, but that such behavior is unpardonable in a Christian who is supposed to have the answers given to him direct from heaven. It may seem incongruous to take as the basic assumption in one's search for God the premise that God is unsearchable. Yet the two propositions seem always to go together. The claim that God can never be known, far from discouraging the search for him, seems to whet men's appetites like nothing else. As surely as a theologian announces with ringing finality that God the Father and the Holy Trinity are mysteries, even to hint at the solution of which is unspeakable presumption, one can count on his launching forthwith into deep researches of his own into the subject, often extending for thousands of pages. The great Athanasius himself, wrote Gibbon in a well-known passage, had, has candidly confessed that whenever he forced his understanding to meditate upon the divinity of the Logos, his toilsome and unavailing efforts recoiled on themselves, that the more he thought, the less he comprehended, the more he wrote, the less capable he was of expressing his thoughts. <clears throat> in every step of the inquiry, we are compelled to feel and acknowledge the immeasurable disproportion between the size of the object and the capacity of the human mind. An end of quote from Gibbon. But how many thousands of columns of the Patrologia does Athanasius fill with his own speculations on the subject and his ferocious denunciations of those who differ from those laboriously contrived opinions? God is great beyond all comprehension of rational minds and spirits, says a liturgy attributed to Ignatius. Precisely therein lies the inescapable necessity for revelation, and precisely therein lies the irresistible challenge of the problem to the invincible ambition and vanity of the human mind. Both Oregon and Irenaeus make it clear as they possibly can that the human intellect cannot hope even to approach remotely the slightest inkling of an idea of the true nature of God, and each then composes volumes on the nature of God. The same is true of Hillary and Basel, the latter filling several books with determined discourses on the exact nature of God, even after he has rebuked the Eunomians, he says, for daring to try to comprehend the divine nature <clears throat> when they cannot comprehend the nature of even the smallest animal. The nature of God is incomprehensible, according to Chrysostom, not only his substance, his usia alone, but his sophia, his wisdom, is incomprehensible, even to the prophets. He is not to be compared even to the supernal virtues or to anything else. It is crime and folly to presume curiously to, expure, uh, to explore his nature. He is incomprehensible even to the angels, and so forth. So what does... Chrysostom do, but devote the greater part of 17 volumes of the Patrologia to exploring and describing the nature of God. The scholastic theologians were the worst offenders in this thing, but we will skip then to come down to the present when Bishop Buchberger, in a new German Catholic lexicon of theology, declares the official position of his church, quote, God cannot be seen but only known through the intellect, and adequate knowledge of God is impossible for us, since God is incomprehensible in the Greiflich. He then launches into a very long and interesting discourse on the various philosophical ways by which one must seek to comprehend God. We cannot, in view of this, be angry with Mr. J.B.S. Haldane, the great British biologist, when he writes, It is also noteworthy that the God of Christianity is far more mysterious and self-contradictory than those of other religions. Though we believe he might temper the charge if we look more closely at the vagaries of the Muslim theologians, your solution, writes Mr. Haldane to a worthy opponent who is defending conventional Christian ideas of God, is to take all these contradictions, or so many of them as you can, 
and solve them by the hypothesis of a being who is at once self-explanatory and utterly mysterious, out of time but everywhere in space, three yet one, and so on. No wonder such a being is incomprehensible, says Haldane. It is incomprehensible because it is self-contradictory. Now the churchmen have always insisted that since God is incomprehensible to the mind, in the end our belief in him and our knowledge of him rest on faith alone. We can never know, says Hillary, for example, how it was possible for Christ to be born, suffer, die, be resurrected, and shed tears. Such things are totally beyond our comprehension. Still, we are required to believe that they happened. We must have faith. There is no use, says Chrysostom, knocking ourselves out, polu pragmaniste, trying to comprehend these things, these mysteries, since they are incomprehensible. When God chooses to reveal, then we know, and it is by faith and not by reason that we come to know divine things. Granting that, then, why the everlasting search? Why the ceaseless quest that at best can only lead us back to what we believe in the first place? Almost every great intellectual search for God begins significantly enough with an apology for the undertaking. We are told that this investigation is not being undertaken because the church requires it, heaven forbid. How could a church claiming to have true revealed religion admit for a moment that it was actually dependent on philosophy for its knowledge of God? No, we are told that the search along philosophical lines is necessary because there are unbelievers who have to be convinced, and they will not listen to arguments based on scriptures. It's further explained that even professing believers may derive real benefit from a discipline by which, according to a famous formula, the true religion is rendered more efficacious, is nourished, defended, and strengthened. Philosophy is not necessary, you understand, but it is a real help. One cannot help asking at this point, does the revealed truth require any such help at all? One of the great hallmarks of truth, as Milton teaches us, is that it can defend itself. It needs no special pleading, let alone battalions of technically trained experts to render it effective. If men do not accept the gospel as it stands, there is no profit in dressing it up to make it more appetizing. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, said the Lord, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. The gospel needs no adorning, to use St. Augustine's word. If it is the supreme truth, it cannot possibly be helped out, but only harmed by officious activities and extraneous ornaments of professional pleaders and skillful salesmen. What about the missionaries, you ask? An excellent case in point. In ancient as in modern times, the missionaries of the church have impressed the world before everything by their notorious lack of any special training or talent. To survive in such hands, the gospel must be its own advocate, and it is. It can safely be trusted to delivery by the weak and unprepossessing. Only when men are entirely without pretense, even when that means being without education or polish, can the Holy Ghost speak for itself. No, that is an unconvincing argument that the heathen must be impressed and the believers reassured by the offices of philosophy. But the commonest defense of the intellectual quest for God is that it was forced on the church as a necessary tool with which to meet the onslaught of learned pagans. The world had to be met with its own weapons. Fire fought with fire. But the early Christians had fought fire with water, not fire. Do not try to meet the world on its own grounds, the apostolic fathers had advised the saints. Its weapons are not our weapons. The philosophic backfires, which the later churchmen set against the heretic and pagan, quickly spread and by the fourth century got completely out of hand. A mighty conflagration, says Socrates, that's the historian, with the Christian carrying the vices of the philosophers to greater extremes than the pagans ever had. To use another figure, when in an early time the intellectual virus threatened the church, certain men took it upon themselves to inoculate the church against it. Heedless of the warnings of the apostolic fathers that the untried serum would prove fatal, and it did, the church promptly came down with a first-class case of Morbus Scholasticus, which broke all records for virulence and from which it has never recovered. Let us return to Justin's story with which we began about the old man. After Justin had admitted to the aged Christian that the main business of philosophy is the search for God, the old man asked him point blank, what do you say God is? Justin answered again without hesitation, as any philosopher would, that which always has the same relationship to things is always the same in itself and which is the cause of all other things. That is God. Then the old man asked him how such a being can be known, leading him on with an interesting proposition. If someone were to tell you, he says, <coughs> that there is in India an animal shaped like no other animal on earth but of such and such a nature, a complex and variegated beast. You wouldn't really know what it was like until you'd seen it. And what's more, you couldn't say anything about it unless you had talked with somebody who had seen it. To this, Justin agrees. 
Well then, says the old Christian, how can the philosophers think correctly about God or say anything true about him since they don't have any actual knowledge of him, having at no time either seen or heard? To this crass bit of early Christian literalism, our pagan Justin is quick to reply, but my dear old man, God is not to be seen with the eyes as other living things are, but only to be grasped with the mind, as Plato says, and I believe him. Then he goes on to explain how, according to Plato, God is seen with the mind's eye. He being the cause of all perceptible things, but himself having no color, no shape, no dimension, none of such qualities as may be seen by the eye, but yet is that which exists, as I said, beyond all existence, you see, a substantia, unutterable, indescribable, and yet alone beautiful and good, coming as a direct intuition to properly disposed spirits because of their kinship and their desire to see him end of quote by the pagan philosopher Justin. Here surely is a strange state of things. Justin, the unenlightened heathen, defending what were to become strictly orthodox Christian ideas about God against a venerable Christian whose literal mindedness was to become anathema to the churchmen of a later day. Justin, the pagan schoolman, devoting his life to the search for God while his first Christian friend with amused detachment comments on the obvious futility of such a course. Either Justin's account is confused or else the Christians did an about-face in their thinking about God. That the latter is the case is clearly proven by the behavior of Justin himself. It is characteristic, wrote Hoysey, that after his conversion he remained the profession, he retained the profession and even the costume of the traveling teachers of philosophy, the sophist. And now, as a Christian philosopher, sought to be effective through writing, teaching, and discussion. Thus the charismatic, that is, the inspired teachers of the early Christian period were supplanted by a secular teaching profession, end of quote, who spent their time searching for God. That is what happened. Justin was, the only, was only one of many who in his own and the following centuries was to come into the church, bringing with him as his most precious possession and his most esteemed contribution to the heritage, the heritage of classic philosophy, with its basic program of the search for God. If the Latter-day Saints have never joined the bemused company groping for God in the wan half-light of a pagan limbo, it's because they have had prophets to speak to them. God, said Paul to Timothy, will have all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And then he predicts that the time is coming and soon when the church will harbor those who are ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. These became the exponents of the endless search for God.